We're going to start our conversations today about wildfires with some of the theoretical backgrounds and some of the, the basic science, the basic uh, um, goings on of wildfires. After this, we'll progress into talking about some case studies and um, uh, management and all that kind of good stuff. So, so wildfire. So the first thing we need to say before we go any further is we're talking here about wildfire. And wildfire is not this. Well, this could be this. But um, the key thing here is we want to distinguish between uh, typical fire that most of us think about in most situations and wildfire. The main difference is fire is typically what we have in a human dominated landscape. So in, in a suburb, in an urban setting, something of that nature that's primarily combusting, primarily burning um, our, our homes or our business or our stadium or whatever it is. Um, with fire, we have, uh, at least in the United States, we have a robust infrastructure to deal with this. So we have networks of local fire departments, volunteer fire departments, county fire departments, state and federal firefighters that are all trained very, very, uh, you know, they're, they're paid exceedingly well. They're trained exceedingly well. They have all kinds of fantastic technology and tools and an infrastructure of water to try to deal with um, fires that might erupt. The general approach with fires is to attack them and put them out. So when a house erupts, when the school catches on fire, all the resources marshaled to the site stop the fire, right? Or, or if it's just some totally crazy out of control, at least not, not let it go beyond that particular building, let's say. So in this case, this house has caught fire and this house is unfortunately burning and, and that's horrible. Um, but we can see this is an area, there's a street, we can see there's, there's sidewalks and things of this nature. This is in an, an urban setting. Um, this picture here uh, that we're, we started the, the lecture with, this is in a natural setting. This is in a so-called wildland setting. The main difference here is when fires happen in these settings, we do not, generally speaking, unless they're very small, we generally speaking do not attempt to put them out per se. Instead, we attempt to contain them with a series of fire uh, breaks, um, existing uh, fire roads and things of this nature. Um, all the, the, or at least many of the tools that we use in urban settings or for urban fires can also be applied to wildfires, but the scale and the fuels are such that once they start, it's almost impossible to stop them in most settings. So whereas traditional fires that we're used to experiencing, seeing on the television and things of that nature, are attack, put out. Wildfires are more figure out where it's going, get um, vulnerable things, people, animals, whatever, out of the way, and try to let it burn itself out. Whereas with a traditional fire, we go up to it and we put it out. With wildfires, we talk about containment, meaning trying to circle it so that we have complete control and the fire cannot escape whatever the containment lines that we deem uh, are in that particular situation. Okay, so we're going to be talking about wildfire today and the rest of our conversations. We're not, while we might touch on fire in the context of something like the San Francisco earthquake or something of that nature, and this is not to minimize the role of urban fires, but really what we're talking about here in terms of major disasters, etc., we're talking about wildfire on wild lands. Okay, so the summary version of this initial part of our discussion about the, the goings on of fire. Um, it's a natural process. Um, and it only, you know, it's been going on for, you know, at least probably 3 billion years or so on our planet. Um, but only again, as with all of these issues that we're talking about, the notion of natural process is just the goings on of the system of the earth. Hazard is when humans 
come into potential contact with this event. And then disaster is the is once we do come into contact and we, we suffer harm. Uh, again, the terminology there. Um, there are some key effects of fires. There's some key benefits of fires. Um, not all, in, in some cases, if we talk about, mm, what do I want to say, a meteor falling to earth, not a huge number of upsides for us. In the case of fire, there's, there's potentially a lot of upsides. And indeed, fire is a key natural part of many of our terrestrial ecosystems. So indeed, many of our terrestrial ecosystems need fire to function um, in a robust manner, to function uh, as they've evolved, etc. So it's, we're going to see a balance here between the, down, the negative downsides and the positive upsides. Um, there are links to other hazards, most conspicuously climate change and drought. Um, we, uh, not so much, maybe the very end of this lecture, we'll talk a little bit about efforts to minimize fire hazards, but um, basically that has to do with human behavior primarily. And, uh, and, and, and again, in a subsequent lecture, we'll talk a bit more about how we might need to be, how we humans might need to be adjusting to deal with wildfire. Make sense, you guys? Any questions so far? Okay. All right, so uh, as I said before, uh, wildfire is, as long as we've had uh, biomass essentially on the surface of the earth and oxygen in, um, in the atmosphere, uh, this is, this is a, a natural thing. Primarily, we think of it as being fueled by woody vegetation or trees and uh, annual grasses. Those are the two big uh, players. Uh, not the only players, but those are, are the, the largest uh, parts of the um, story here in terms of the fuel. Um, before humans were, uh, well, even when humans were around, but before humans really had a lot of technology and were organized into relatively large population centers, Fire is pretty much burned and did, and even after that, fire is pretty much burned and did what they're going to do until the fuel was gone. And so uh, humans were essentially get out of the way, and that was about all the, the interaction we had. Uh, um, pretty quickly, humans figured out ways to start to use this fire, and fire is one of the um, oldest tools that we began to manipulate and use to change our environment and manipulate our environment in a way that we felt was more beneficial to us. Um, yeah, right, so so jump a little bit out of order here, my, my bullets, but um, uh, obviously fire for cooking things, but also fire for manipulating landscapes, fire for driving animals, uh, either directly from flames or from smoke uh, into certain areas or corralling uh, critters in certain areas. Uh, the reason Yosemite Valley, the floor of Yosemite Valley looks the way it did, is it looks the way it does, is because of the way uh, the native peoples there actively burned and actively changed the vegetative landscape in that that uh, valley um, uh, with fire. Um, when John Muir famously came into Yosemite Valley the very first time, he was on the back of a horse, you know, a tall horse, and he was a, a, a not super tall man, but, you know, pretty decent sized male. And so that guy on top of a horse could walk straight into Yosemite Valley and no big deal. Right. So he didn't have to duck, he didn't have to put his head underneath the branches, whatever. All of that clearing was a consequence of the active use of fire um, um, and, and, and the way it was used for thousands of years by um, native Californians. Uh, and then, and then uh, lastly, by way of introduction, uh, just to say that really, in effect, wildfire, and indeed, I'm going to be arguing, I believe, that most of these disasters that we're going to be talking about in our class, um, they function as a disturbance, right? We get worried if the disturbance is excessive, or what we might per perceive to be excessive, but in reality, it's acting as a disturbance to the system. In the wake of that disturbance, we get 
um, the stimulation of growth, either because of uh, the fertilization or the, or the addition of different materials to the ground, because of the signaling to organisms that have evolved with fire through smoke or heat or whatever, that, hey, it's time to germinate now or, or, or sprout in a certain way. Um, and, then, and then ultimately, it's, it's a large space clearer outer. So it is a large resetter of spatial competition. So clearing a space. So now those seeds can land and start to grow. Now those um, small mammals can more easily run through the undergrowth and not be clogged up and in, 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 in tripping over uh, shrubs and, and dense uh, foliage and things of that nature. So wildfire, like most of our disasters, functions to disturb the system. And I think it's, it's really important to conceive of wildfire as a process. So um, what, what, do we, what do I mean by that? Well, I mean, uh, again, using my, uh, <laughs> I'm afraid I'm gonna be, I need, I need to come up with some other examples, but my default example of the asteroid striking the earth, right? That's not really so much of a process. That's a disturbance, but it's not so much of a process. Wildfire is much more of a thing. It's much more cyclic, right? Um, fuels grow up, they can burn, they go away, then more fuels come up and, and that type of thing. Um, wildfire uh, at this event as it's happening um, can become a self-sustaining process. So we might burn one tree and if there's other trees close enough, that, that process, that oxidation process, those flames can then jump on another tree and keep it going, and then maybe jump on another tree and keep it going. Fire is high temperature oxidation. Okay, it's the chemical conversion. It's the the addition of oxygen to compounds and oxidizing them in a dramatic way, <laughs> in a very visual and very uh, you know impressive way. But nevertheless, it, it's it's oxidation. To have uh, fire to have wildfire, we need uh, fuel. We need the the, the stuff that's going to provide the the biomass, the stuff that's going to be converted chemically. Oxygen, the thing that's going to essentially uh, spark the process. Well, actually, heat's the thing that's going to spark it, but oxygen is the thing that's going to enable the chemical reaction, and then heat. Uh, as I mentioned, we're talking about oxidi ox an oxidizing reaction here. That is exactly the reverse of photosynthesis. So photo photosynthesis is, is a reduction reaction, right? And we're, cre we're taking uh, carbon dioxide from the atmosphere and, uh, and, and some energy in the form of sunlight and making complex uh, carbohydrates, making sugars, right? And when, when your body, when you need to go lift your uh, weights or you need to um, uh, 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 chop your carrots or whatever you're going to do, the energy for that muscle is actually to burn that fuel. And so in a, basically, uh, chemically, what's going on in your muscles when you consume the energy that was, that was fixed during photosynthesis same, same thing as what fires are doing. Fires are just doing it more in, uncontrolled. When you you know, move your arm, all the stuff that's going on in there is within your cells and is in the, is in under physiological constraint. When the tree goes up, it's out of control. Um, uh, and so as a consequence, just like when you breathe out, um, uh, I'm most of what's coming out of here is carbon dioxide out of my mouth and water vapor, right? Hopefully no COVID because, you know, we're being all socially distanced and safe. But, but, but that, that coming out is also the predominant compounds that are, that are coming out when we have a wildland fire and the, and the compounds that are going up into the atmosphere. Um, so this is the, the fire triangle. We need all three of these things to have fire. And you'll hear this a lot if you uh, hang out with, with, uh, firemen and and especially fire season or when it's a big long burning fire and the the talking heads on television that have been talking for three hours about this crazy fire need something else to talk about but we'll usually get get to this and again the three key elements to have flame 
oxygen, heat, and fuel. And so what folks that are trying to manage an active fire are trying to do is knock down one or more of these uh, legs of the, the tripod, if you will. And if we can take one of those out, at least one of those out, um, it, it can happen. And uh, so that's, that's the so-called uh, triangle. Uh, questions? Any questions so far? Making sense? Yeah. Yeah. All right, cool. All right. Uh, phases. So we'll talk about the three different phases of burning, of a, of a, of a tree igniting. First phase is pre-ignition. And so this is before we see the actual flames on the leaves. Uh, fuel. We need to have the fuel. Um, and again, this is, we can maybe generalize some of these um, approach, and uh, obviously not, not the specific physics of this, but the general ideas I think are also in many cases generalizable to um, some of our other disasters, again, particularly ones that, that are, are successional or that can be dynamic and feed on themselves. First is we have to have the fuel. In the context of wildfire, what we mean by fuel is um, the temperature and the water content have to be favorable to ignition. So if it's minus 50 degrees out, it's going to be very hard to catch that uh, branch on fire, right? If it's 120 degrees out, much easier to catch that branch on fire. Uh, and that, that, that fuel essentially is more primed. Same thing with water. If we have uh, middle of winter, um, very uh, wet soils, and this plant is drinking up that water, and there's a relatively high water content all throughout the branches and trunks and crown and everything, hard to catch that fuel on fire. If we are in the end of summer, early fall, particularly if we haven't had rain in a long time, that uh, plant material is going to be much drier and therefore much more likely to be able to catch fire. Um, we can have, uh, so another factor that can help with, with before we get things ignited is so-called preheating. And the preheating is just going to exacerbate those two things I just mentioned. So the, the preheating is going to, in effect, drive out more water, make the, make the plant more water stressed. And uh, oftentimes we'll, we'll bring to the surface or, or make uh, more easily accessible uh, volatiles that um, things that, are, that the, the gases that can easily catch fire. So think of walking through a pine forest and all that that great smell, you know, the great piney smell. A lot of that, the the the, the terpenes, the the you know, the saps and all that kind of stuff are walking through a eucalyptus grove. That same kind of stuff. Those oils, those things are all more likely to catch fire. And as we um, get warmer and warmer, we make those compounds more likely to move around and, and, and bump around and, and come into contact with something that will light us up. <clears throat> uh, pyrolysis is a process that's going to chemically uh, degrade the fuel and, uh, again, make it more likely to, um, to be uh, ignitable. Um, uh, what else do I want to say here? Um, yeah, right. So, so, so pyrolysis is something that can happen, uh, particularly if we have a fire front as that front is coming along, um, and, and happens in the way in the, just before the flames get to where you're going. Okay. Uh, then we get to the next phase is combustion. So we have pre-ignition, then combustion. Combustion is, is the match, you know, holding it to the wood. Combustion it begins with ignition, and that's the introduction of energy. Uh, could be in the form of a lightning bolt. Could be in the form of uh, someone with a, uh, a piece of garden equipment that that has struck a rock and, and created a spark. Can come from many uh, potential things, but we need that that literal spark to get things going. Once that happens, um, it initially starts on the outer parts of the of the the fuel typically plant tissue um, and uh, we start to see that in the form of the flames which we see visually and we feel the temperature increase um, 
Yeah. So just because we have ignition doesn't necessarily mean we have a wildfire. We could, we can have ignition and maybe it, it hits one leaf and it starts to burn and then it hits um, a, a more moist part of the branch or something and it just doesn't really go anywhere. Um, so while we have to have combustion, com that initial ignition doesn't necessarily lead to fire. Um, we have to have a lot of fuel. We have to have enough fuel. Um, right. And then the last bullet here is that um, when we have a, a large wildfire and the front is moving, it's generally speaking not the case that we have just one fire and that fire is sort of, you know, donut holing out or, you know, or, or, or expanding out. It is expanding out, but what, how the process normally works is uh, sparks, embers, little parts of that fire go forward and, and activate yet another fire. So it's, it's the, the chemically, the process is uh, going out and it's a, you know, a thousand, 10,000 little mini fires all starting in the front of the fire line. Um, okay. Uh, then we'll get uh, flaming combustion. And this is once it, once it's actually starting to go, those flames from the branch can catch other branches on and it starts to be a, a, a self, uh, a, there's supposed to be a feedback mechanism where the flame tends, as long as it has fuel and, and air and oxygen, will then start to make more flame, which then in turn makes more flame, which then in turn makes more flame. Uh, yeah, and so, and this is what we typically, in our heads, this is what we're typically thinking of as wildfire. Um, yeah, I'll just say that. Um, we can also have, uh, smoldering combustion. This is where, this is more typically where we have something, uh, partially buried. We can get this in things like, um, tar seeps that have, that have been exposed at high temperature and, and can catch fire. We can also get this when we have a, um, wildfire like, like condition and say, uh, firefighters would come in and knock down a tree and throw dirt on it or whatever to try to bury it and knock down the, the major flames, um, which, you'll, which you'll hear a lot about in terms of wildfire. Once the process has begun and we have the major flames under control, you'll hear about mopping up operations. These mopping up operations are really designed to try to go after and make sure we, we take care of any smoldering areas. So areas that might not at first glance, look like they're on fire, but actually they're, they're, they're burning subsurface. So trunks, uh, the root structures of, of trees might still be um, burning. Um, and those are things that if left unchecked could, uh, you know, pop back even days later, theoretically even weeks later, um, and, and reignite unburned fuel. Uh, so this is what, this is, uh, what we basically have um, in a fire. Um, we have uh, the the part over here on the left has burned. And so this is, this is uh, you know, a, a charcoal trees and black vegetation and um, dead animals and things of that nature. Over here, we have the forest or the vegetation that is not yet burned and has lots of fuel that potentially can burn. And uh, we have this flaming front typically. Now there the will be there will be some um, smoldering going on here. There will be some pockets that are still burning, but really it's it's more like a um, like if we look at a uh, bacterial growth on a petri dish where we really have this front. The action is really not always, but oftentimes in that edge. And that edge is where we're trying what we're trying to deal with, where the where the flames are the largest, et cetera. Um, good. Uh, question so far? Making sense? Yeah. Okay. So now once we have this fire going, this heat is going to really help again, is going to, so the part, the, the part on the right here that hasn't caught fire, the heat is going to help to make those green trees more likely to burn. And so there's this, there's this uh, invisible wave of infrared radiation that goes in front of this uh, active flame, making it more likely that those green trees will burn uh, relative to if there had been no 
of if you know say the day before or something if that the with those flames were not there um yep just said that uh yeah ba basically as we go forward um we are bringing both temperature and the conversion of all those things i mentioned before the volatiles will or, or the compounds will, will volatize and become more um uh, in the air, and so therefore more more have a higher propensity to burn, um, et cetera. Uh, also, also uh, as we'll talk about in a bit, um, this heat transfer is going to tend to move air masses, and the hotness, the the differential in temperature is going to have the effect of making air masses move, and those winds are going to. Um, just just like if you're trying to start a campfire or, or trying to start the barbecue and you're like, I can't get it going, you blow on it, right? You get some of that that air going on it and, and that'll get, get it going. So um, so heat transfer also helps in moving air masses around. Um, if we had, okay, so here we go. Here's, here's, here's another one. So here we go. So here over here on the left, would be the burned part of the fire. The burned part of the fire on the right would be the unburned fire. This fire front would be moving from the left side of your screen to the right side of your screen. And um, what's going to tend to happen is we're going to get air sucked up in the back and sucked up in the front. Oops, I just advanced my slide. Sorry. Um, and uh, so we'll tend to get really tall. So with no strong atmospheric winds um, will have, we always have some amount of winds from the fire front itself, but left to their own devices, those flames will tend to go upwards and get tall. Uh, in cases like this, one of the big worries if we're in a forest is so-called crown fires. We'll, we'll talk about that later, but crown fires are where the top of the tree burns and oftentimes would kill the tree. Uh, a small fire on the bottom wouldn't necessarily kill the tree. Um, but then when we have, and so this is maybe, uh, I mean, we, we all these types of fires have existed throughout history. But I would say that the classic quote unquote fire back in the day was example A here. B is for places like California, places like Australia, um, this is becoming much more the norm, which is B, which is, uh, wind-driven fires, and by wind-driven, I mean very intense wind-driven. Not even though fires can indeed create their own air movement and it can be intense at times. Here, I'm talking about large-scale wind over the entirety of the landscape, over all of Santa Barbara, Ventura, LA County, or all of Southern California, or all of the San Francisco Bay Area. That kind of thing. Those very large-scale regional wind events. And like in the Thomas fire, um, you know, the flames at some points were absolutely 45 degree angle flames. In some cases, they were almost close to parallel to the ground. And so it was much more akin to a blowtorch as opposed to a sort of traditional campfire. Um, and that makes the fires move potentially incredibly fast. So, you know, uh, the Woolsey fire um, started in uh, near Simi Valley. And if you guys imagine Simi Valley trying to trying to go to the beach in Malibu, right? So, I mean, we have freeways and stuff, but if you're in Simi Valley and you're trying to get to Malibu, you're talking like what, 40 minutes, you know, something, something like that, right? Um, uh, that's about as fast as the flames went from Simi Valley to, um, Westlake Village. They, did, they didn't quite get to, to the PCH that fast, but incredibly fast. I mean, I mean, really, really fast. And, and so basically the speed of you in a car moving on a freeway potentially um, speed. So this is, so these wind driven fires are really crazy beasts. Much of our policy has been developed conceptualizing example A here, right? And as we're finding more and more with climate change and our altered systems and, and this global weirding weather, I like to use the term global weirding rather than global warming because it's, it's just weirding out everything. Um, but this, this, this weirding of our wind patterns and, and 
and changing of what we've come to be familiar with over hundreds of years is a real challenge. Um, and so we have embers going, um, you know, I've, I've, I've had, uh, how far embers go in fires is, is an interesting question. Everybody seems to have a different number, but certainly in um, places, in conditions like the Thomas fire, we absolutely got ignitions more than a mile from the front line. And I have firefighters swear to me that they think they can go at least five miles, right? And, and ember. So meaning, meaning so, so here, A is sort of what we've built stuff on. And, and if you can imagine, here's the fire, the firemen come in on the, uh, you know, up to the, the green trees and they kind of start to f fight the flames or whatever, or try to save the house. But you can imagine if this, if we're in condition B, man, you're not just on that row of houses or or school or businesses or whatever they are there, but you need to be miles into the um, into the suburbs or into the urban core in case those embers fly. And it's just a much more difficult, um, uh, intractable beast to do that. Okay. Uh, okay, so so uh, we 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 had before it started to burn, we had the ignition and the combustion, and now we have uh, the extinction. So the extinction is when the fire when the flames go out. Again, this is where we lose our fire triangle. We lose one of the one of the legs of the of the triad, and at that point the flames stop. The flames go away. Um, there there could, could still be hot. There could still be you know. Embers warm, but the active process of oxidation is either stopped or massively reduced. Um, cool. Okay, so there we go. So those are, that's a, those are the three aspects of fire. Let's talk about some of these um, the components here. The big story with wildfire is, of course, the fuel. Is of course the material that's being burnt. And and while uh, your house, my house, uh, your car, uh, you know, lots of things, boats, airplanes, you know, lots of things can burn. Uh, primarily here in wildfires, we're talking about vegetation. We're talking about, we're talking about biomass and we're primarily talking about theoretically, you know, I can burn as horrible as that sounds and, and, and the dogs and cats and things can burn. But primarily here, we're talking about vegetation. Uh, and again, uh, the two broad categories here, we're talking about woody plants, so trees, shrubs, and then um, uh, non-woody vegetation, classically here, grasses, um, particularly annual grasses that uh, germinate, grow, and then die back. So we have a lot of dry material, typically at the end of the summer, when it's the driest time of the year. Um, uh, we, oh, another, another important type of fuel, which is again, still just a type of plant, but because it can sometimes behave differently, this would be peat. So peat is very, 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 very slowly decomposing a plant material, um, that w was in and around a wetland or a former wetland. Um, and so this is, uh, has such a lack of oxygen. Normally if we had the the plant matter and it fell on the surface of the of the soil and it just sat there in the sun. It would oxidize. It would degrade. Bacteria would eat it. You know, fungal hyphae would attack it and it would be broken down relatively quickly. In a, 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 a peat situation, those materials. A lot of times it could be things like sphagnum moss, which is um, uh, what we see in places like the tundra and 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 similar alpine environments. Um, that stuff, uh, instead of breaking down rapidly, because it's been in a wetland, either constrained with water or sediments, it still breaks down, but it takes a long time. And it's it's a classic, uh, very carbon rich fuel. And in fact, in places like uh, uh, Scotland, it's historically been a fuel. And in, in places like Canada, it's historically been a fuel. So whereas we might chop down a tree and burn the tree, Folks there would go out and, and cut blocks of of peat out and um, and and use it as people maybe would use coal. Uh, okay, um, yeah. So then another aspect uh, that can be at play is the size of the fuel. 
So just like you would say, try to go make a campfire or a fire in your backyard, um, it's really hard to start with a giant log of, of an oak tree. Much easier to start with the little twigs from an oak branch. So the same thing here. So um, what's going on there is we have fuel, but is, has a high amount of con or high contact, a lot of surface area in contact with the atmosphere, with the oxygen. And so it's much easier to ignite that fuel versus when you have a big giant log, there's a huge amount of fuel, but a relatively small amount of that fuel has access to the um, oxidizing environment. Uh, other things that can that can um, uh, influence fuel loads are uh, landslides and hurricanes and other st wind driven storms in particular that are going to move things around and act to pile up um, organic debris. So tree trunks at the bottom of a, a, a creek or, or side of a mountain, that type of thing. Um, yeah, so there we go. Um, so that's fuel. Another aspect is the shape of the surface of the earth. Uh, generally speaking, um, the shape or, or, or the topography, the, the two things here we're, we're most interested in are uh, places that typically, well, not two things, but places that typically accumulate moisture and the converse places that tend to not accumulate moisture. Places that tend to be uh, facing the sun, so tend to be drier, or places that, that tend to be more in the shade. Um, and then areas that tend to be uh, more exposed to consistent winds, which generally speaking act to desiccate or dry out the plants by, um, by wicking moisture from the tissues. All of those things are going to uh, um, uh, make the uh, fuel load more more potentially burnable. Um, yeah, and then canyons are another classic one. Although this is very interesting, um, it, it's this is still in the early stages. But um, so uh, in the wake of some about fifteen years ago, in the wake of some fires in San Diego County, the electric utility San Diego Gas and Electric wanted to better understand winds, particularly things related to Santa Ana type conditions. Um, Santa Ana wind conditions. And so they actually instrumented, they put in a bunch of, of uh, weather instruments. How are we doing on time? We're getting close to a break. We're getting close to a break. Um, uh, weather instruments uh, in and around their areas of operations because they want to know, hey, is, is there a big wind coming in and should we shut down power to these people so that we wouldn't have power lines toppled, etc.? And up to then, what we always thought was that um, in canyons, that's where we got our strongest winds. So windy everywhere, to be sure, but but the canyons are really where it's honking and really crazy. And what some of that data showed was counterintuitively, some incredibly strong winds were at the tops of hills. So it is true that the topography is going to influence wind and all this and that, but but we're still trying to understand exactly how it works. But it is true that there's variability in the landscape based on the surface, based on the shape of the earth. Um, I'll also say I, I learned about weather. So, so I'm a marine biologist by training. Um, and, uh, when I first went up to do my postdoc, which is it, which is it, um, so I, I work primarily wetlands, uh, coastline underwater. Then for my postdoc, I went and I was working primarily in coastal grasslands, oak woodlands, uh, these types of uh, terrestrial environments. And I said, hey, I want to know what the rainfall is. What's the rainfall in, on my plots in, in this area, this grassland I was trying to restore? And everybody kept saying, oh, yeah, so the station is in San Jose, which is, you know, 20 miles away. And I'm thinking, the station's at, like, what? Hey, what? And so I went and got some of my own weather instruments, in this case, uh, rainfall gauges. And I just wanted to know. And because I bought some extra ones, I was like, well, I can put a rain gauge out or and put the rest in my lab. I was like, well, screw it. I got the stuff. Let's put it out. So I put them out very close to one another. Super different. Super different. Sometimes as much as an inch or two difference in terms of rain, even though one was 500 feet over there and one was 500 feet over there. 
And so that's when I learned, then I started talking to meteorologists and stuff, and I learned that, oh yeah, things are always highly variable. The wind is always super variable, and the precipitation is always highly variable. So, you know, we just take measurements and then we average them, um, which I was like, huh, that's weird. I thought that all these terrestrial guys had this stuff figured out. But but um, long story short, we there, there's a lot of fine scale patchiness in terms of how air moves, how rainfall happens across our landscapes. And I'll just say that we're still still trying to figure that out. We have a pretty good sense of the overall, like what's going on with Ventura County, what's going on with California. But at that really fine scale, is my house going to get rain or or super windy? We're surprisingly not quite, uh, maybe not surprising, but, but we're not quite as good with that. Um, okay, and the last thing to say here with topography is, um, and this might be counterintuitive, but um, uh, fire goes uh, super fast uphill, right? And so it's it's because as it's burning, right, the air is rising, that warmer air is rising. And so um, fires can go incredibly fast uphill and the drying of the fuels are going to happen that much more intensely uh, upslope. Uh, they, can, they can move fast downslope too, but, but upslope is a classic one if we just had to pick something. Uh, yeah, and so there's a picture of it right there. Um, why don't we talk about this next slide, and then we'll take a, take a, a pause, take a break here. Um, so, okay, so weather. Um, obviously... Droughts are a huge factor here. So droughts are going to create water stress. Droughts are going to have the effect of um, plants being water stressed and therefore not having as much water in their, um, in their body itself. And also, uh, when plants are going to get stressed, one of the things they'll do is they'll tend to sort of, if you will, fold back their resources. So they'll tend to drop things, drop leaves, drop branches, whatever, and those dead or dying parts of the plant are going to be even more so uh, dried and fuel for fires. Uh, when we have these droughts also, um, and this is a classic story in the southwestern U.S. in uh, summertime, which are these you know afternoon thunderstorms, right? These so-called dry thunderstorms where we get a lot of lightning, um, but... Uh, not much rain, or it can be so warm that that rain never actually gets to the ground. And so that's the worst possible thing, right? Because we have thunderstorms, so huge ignition sources going off, boom, 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 and it, the sky might look dark, right? And it might it might look gray, and so you might think, oh man, great, we're going to get dumped on. Uh, not necessarily. So uh, many of our fires, particularly in the western U.S., are driven by... Um, uh, late in the day, uh, summer, sort of monsoonal type of dry thunderstorms. Uh, fires burn when humidity is lowest, obviously. Um, yeah, when it's windy, uh, uh, all that stuff can come together and produce uh, fi either ignitions or fuel more fires.